I begin with, uh, is it still afternoon? Yeah, good afternoon, almost evening. You know, shalom, shalom alaikum. And uh, you see the Jamaican hat on, so how you all keep it. And uh, we say, I hope you keep it fine. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, and thank you all for being here. The, um, for me, there, it's funny, I agreed to speak before I reflected on uh, certain things uh, that also solidify my agreement to speak. One of them is that it turns out this year is the 20th anniversary of my first two books. The first one was Bad Faith and Anti-Black Racism, which is connected to the theme of this meeting. And the sec that one came out in January uh, 1995. And the second one is Phenomenon, the Crisis of European Man that came out in September 1995. So although there's this new Phenomenon book, and Phenomenon would have been 90, Soft would have been 110, the, uh, you know, the, the reality is that those themes, this is a way in a way to celebrate a, an anniversary of those works. It's also rock, rock, a bit auspicious since in writing those works, uh, the situation of the works I'm doing now, the fact that I just wrote a new Fanon book, but also this year I found myself writing a few things on Sart. Now, writing these works on Sart um, really occasioned a form of reflection on a few other things. Because, just to give you an idea, in 1995, when those first two books came out, the environment was very, very uh, neurotic and ironic, okay? Now, the neurotic part, and also the ironic part, emerged primarily because there's something about Sartre and Fanon that really piss a lot of people off. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's not just the things they said. You know, I mean, there are people who say things to annoy people. But, you know, what some people won't admit is what really bothers a lot of people is that the way those two young men, and then I'm going to, you know, I'm trying to remember, but, but also I'm going to talk about Beauvoir a bit. The way these people lived their lives made a lot of other people feel accused. You know what I mean? I mean, could you, you know, first of all, you know, when people read, there's, there's nothing more fun than seeing students read about the lives of Simone de Beauvoir, Sartre, and Fanon, you know? Because as they read, they suddenly sort of look up at all the adults around and everybody else, and they're like, you know, you ain't all that. <laughs> okay. Now, within that framework, um, one of the things, of course, is this problem of really living one's life. And this really living one's life raises for people issues of authenticity. But I don't think that would do justice to them. Uh, we heard some talk earlier about authenticity. And one of the things I've argued in uh, 20 years ago is that authenticity doesn't quite capture what Sartre or Fanon, right, was about. And one of the reasons that authenticity doesn't is because the usual interpretations of authenticity is that they, those interpretations often deal with a form of wholeness, a form of genuineness, a sort of, you know, having things right. But the way, and it was, there was a quote from Bad Faith and Anti-Black Racism earlier, the way that Sartre talked about mauvais espoir or bad faith was such that the opposite of it wasn't authenticity, you see? Authenticity had a sort of relationship to the self that was a problem for Sartre where the self has already been rendered problematic. And in fact, if you look at being in nothingness, what he actually argues is that if one is dealing with the question of bad faith, one has to deal with a critical relationship to evidence. I'm going to return to this question of evidence and evidentiality. Because this question of evidence and evidentiality, in, including in some of the talks I heard earlier, becomes key because they connect to a form of transcending the self that brings one in touch with a world, a social world, okay? Now, the other problem, the neurotic problem that emerges is, 
if you're sitting here on bad faith, you know, it's almost as if an eyebrow goes up. And the eyebrow is basically saying, are you writing about bad faith in bad faith? In fact, there's an almost need for the writer of bad faith to be in bad faith, precisely because there's something about bad faith itself that Sartre talked about, and many others who've really not notice it, is that bad faith is ashamed of itself. And because it's ashamed of itself, it defends itself. So it's almost like, no, you're the one being, no, you, you know the old game, you're the one, no, you're the one who's guilty, you're the one, you're the one. Well, bad faith, of course, stands accused. And so its response is to accuse you. But then there's this other part that's really connected to the question of bad faith. And of course, in the English language, the big problem with bad faith is it has the adjective bad in it. So how are you going to really, that already is going to create problems if you're going to talk about it. In addition to that, we have a legalistic concept called bad faith. It means that you're doing something dishonestly. However, although the word mauvaise is there when you say mauvaise foi, there's a way I found if you say mauvaise foi in English that you get more to the philosophical issue at hand that's dealing with bad faith. And that's the way in which I'm going to talk about it from this point on. And as well, you can think about it in terms of some of the problems raised in German thought when people translate Geist, for instance, into spirit or mind. It doesn't quite work. Geist is something very, very specific, okay? Anyway, that said, I'd like now to outline a little bit of what I'm going to be doing. Now, what I'm going to do here today is I'm going to try to address the theme of the meeting by summarizing what I talked about 20 years ago. And then I want to add some reflections on changes since then. And then really see what I can say about the relevance of that to developments to, you know, today. Now this means looking at Sartre in a way that's very similar to what I did with Fanon. In Fanon, I argued, for instance, there's a distinction with, well, the thing I argued in my work on Fanon is that if Fanon has made a major contribution, then you could use those ideas to understand a lot of other, re other problems today. In other words, the usefulness of a thinker for your intellectual or your research project is what's, to, what's at hand. That's what I argued, for instance, in Fanon, the Christ of the European Man. However, in what Fanon said, Something is happening between Fanon the Christ of the European Man and what Fanon said, and that is a phenomenon called Fanon Studies. And once you have Fanon Studies, there's a way that one has to talk about how you talk about Fanon. So in a way, I'm going to start first with an engagement through what Sartre offers looking at these problems, but then really think about how we talk about Sartre, okay? Since this is the Sartre Society, it's a way of really bringing those themes to the fore. Now, the book, Bad Faith and Anti-Black Racism, it came out, I gotta tell you, it was really, really weird when that book was published. For a second, I thought the door farted. Uh, welcome. You know, one of the things, the first thing that struck me when the book was published was that, especially when you're a young scholar, there's a way that people try to bully you, particularly the academy, to do what everybody else is doing, you see? And at the time, the only ways that anybody seemed interested in talking about race or gender was in terms of, number one, post-structuralism. In fact, the conversations continue to this day. Number two, before it was number one, but post-structuralism pushed it into number two in the academy, was Marxism. Okay, one had to give a Marxism. Number three, which is what dominated a lot of establishment institutions, was liberal political philosophy, which pretty much just meant analytical philosophy, you know, applied to the subject of race or gender. Okay? So that was the environment. Now, Within that environment, there were two expectations. Especially, you notice, we say race and gender. 
But well, one of them was that you compartmentalize race and gender. So it's like, I'm going to talk about race. Now I'm going to talk about gender. And within that compartmentalization, there was also another problem. And this was connected to why post-structuralism, Marxism, and liberal, analytical liberal political theory were dominating. And that other problem was basically a form of methodological fetishism that I called and fed on the Christ of European Man. And in another book, I just gave it the title, Disciplinary Decadence. Okay? Now, you all know, you all are familiar with this phenomenon. If you write something, a lot of people want to identify what you are as a scholar or a thinker. And once they've identified it, they want everything to follow. So the presumption is if you're a post-structuralist, then it means you're going to treat post-structural approaches as methodologically complete, which is a contradiction in terms for post-structuralism. If you are a Marxist, you are expected to do the same. Everything just was applied Marxism, where if one were to dig deeper into Marxism, which is something they decided did, one would find out that is also a performative contradiction of Marxism. And as well, if one is doing li analytical liberal political philosophy, one would treat first order logic as if it's complete. Well, first order is. If the problem is, if you go to second order to deal with the question of how you talk about first order, you have incompleteness. So you had all of these ways that were trying to make themselves absolute. But we know this kind of absoluteness where not only in philosophy, not only in literature, but also in the sciences in general, many, many um, evaluators are more interested in the methods you use than the truth or reality of what you have argued. In other words, you can argue, get away and be awarded with a lot of accolades for, in effect, BS, as long as you have demonstrated adherence to a certain methodology. Now, of course, at this moment, I didn't bring up existential phenomenology or phenomenology. And part of that is because phenomenology and existential thought properly don't begin with the presupposition that there are any of these. It does, they don't begin with the presupposition even that they are philosophy. And for me, that was quite liberating because it meant I could actually look at the phenomena, look at the reality instead of trying to be a philosophical or methodological nationalist. Now this, I'm sorry, so this concern about methodological or philosophical nationalism automatically should let you see that disciplinary decadence, where you in effect treat your discipline as if it's complete and subsumes all reality to it, is a form of mauvaise foi. It is a form of bad faith. Because you'll have to convince yourself that the, the actual method was, was in an isomorphic relationship with all of reality. And we know what that is. That would simply be God. So once you admit that your position isn't God, that your discipline isn't God, it requires identifying mauvais foi within the discipline. For post-structuralism, this also poses another problem. Okay? The other problem is that post-structuralism often demands a particular outcome before the performance. And because of the imposition of a post-structural position before the analysis, it becomes a priori. It becomes, in effect, for instance, the preconceived conception of anti-essentialism paradoxically becomes a form of essentialism. So the task at hand was to put those to the side and look at the work in terms of this question of mauvais foi. Now, one of the things that immediately emerged when I was looking at mauvais foi was that it was not simply a question of looking at the problem in terms of mauvais foi, but it was also to look at the problem of looking at the problem. You see what I'm getting at? The thing about mauvais foi or bad faith, and that, that was, was very striking, is that it's a double move. Because it means in the very act of analysis, one is simultaneously offering a critique of the act of analysis itself. 
And this critique of the of, of, of the active analysis began to deal with the problem of how, for instance, with race and gender, there's a tendency to attempt to analyze race and gender in not as non-relational concepts. You see? And this expectation of non-relationality began to create kinds of discussions that in which one would look at gender as a substance, race as a substance, sexual orientation as a substance, class as a substance, and then ask, for instance, for the primacy of one over the other. The problem with that is that it creates a variety of fallacies. And these fallacies go not only from Sot, but they actually predate Sot. There are fallacies that were identified, for instance, in, in, um, in, in, in Scotland and England and in Ireland by Bishop Barclay and David Hume. If you look at the rise of Bishop Barclay and David Hume, for instance, if you look at how one tries to deal with a substance or the identity of a substance, they would notice that you never just think of the color white or the color red. You think of something that is white or red. You see what I'm getting at? And so the immediate problem, if you try to look at gender, race, and class non-relationally, is that you begin to think of a gender by itself, or a race by itself, or a sexual orientation by itself. I don't know about the rest of you, but I've never seen a race walking that was not gendered, <laughs> that didn't have a sexual orientation of some kind, even if it's working on it, and didn't have some kind of class location and we can build it up. You see what I'm getting at? So this already tells you that there's a form of fallacy at, at already at work. And part of the fallacy is that we're trying to pose a logic in which we can make the concept actually complete over a particular domain. Okay, so you have the race domain, the gender domain, etc., and all the rest would follow. However, however, the problem you have with a lot of these, particularly if we pick race, is first of all, the obvious problem, is race didn't always exist. So to treat race as a substance is already a problem. One has to deal with the question of how race came into the world. And similarly, even when we talk about gender, what we forget, and this is, we've already seen ample references to these, you see, even though the term gender may have been there, the term gender in the way we may mean gender didn't always exist. If you look in there, for instance, on Aristotle's On the Generation of Animals, uh, to be an undeveloped man is not what we mean by a woman. You see what I mean? And if you look at the body of what we call a woman as an undeveloped male body, you're going to have ascribed to that body a constellation of meanings that will change other kinds of relations. For instance, how do you make sense of heterosexuality or homosexuality within that framework if you look, for instance, at a, at a clitoris as simply a tiny penis? Do you see what I'm getting at? Now, that said, the, the task at hand in bad faith and anti-black racism was very straightforward. There's a simple argument, but one of the things that we find out, and you, you know, Einstein said this very well, you know, you try to make sure you make things simple enough to be understood, but not so simple that they're distorted, okay? Now, the simple version is very straightforward. The simple version is this. If you look at racism, Racism is an attempt to make into a category of other human beings the designation of non-human being. Okay? That's basically it. So you have to be able to, in order for racism to work, identify a group of human beings and then deny, to make, you have to make yourself believe they're not really human beings. Now already, many of you who have read Sartre know that to make yourself believe what you don't really believe is a form of wellness. So that's pretty straightforward. And from that point on then, you bring categories, concepts, to help you believe what you don't believe, which is a paradoxical relationship. And this believing what you don't believe then can be extended. So if racism is to make to establish the belief that a group of human beings are not really human beings, that anti-black racism 
is to establish that black people are a group of people who are not really people, and to establish a belief in that system of the human being before you as not being human. Now, that part of the argument is very straightforward. However, the complicated part emerges about what comes from this. How do you explain this? And the explanations at hand are manifold, OK? One of the, one of the implications that's manifold is the fact that if you're going to make it a philosophical ex question, the obvious question is, how in the world is it possible to make yourself believe what you don't believe? That's already something very weird. The other part that's very weird is that if there is a form of relationship, if it's fundamentally relational, then what is happening if you try to establish something non-relational? And the old way of looking at this is the non-relational appeal to a metaphysics of what we call substance. The substance metaphysics dealt with the idea that a thing can be what it is completely independent of a relationship with other things. The problem is that that doesn't work for the human world. You see, in the human world, even if one is raising, the very act of just raising the question to think is an establishment of reason to, a uh, relationship to it. And it's very fascinating, by the way, because I also do some work with theoretical physicists. And one of the insights in quantum mechanics is a phenomenological insight. Because a lot of quantum mechanics comes around the question of how one is going to deal with the establishment of a very relationship of the thing that's being studied, studied and how it affects it. Now, the other thing that begins to emerge is also this. If one is going to retreat into a pleasing falsehood, clearly there's something about racism what one appeals to as a false belief that enables one to maintain that kind of system, right? There is the question of whether such kind of kinds of lying are even possible without certain modes of human reality, certain modes of social reality. And this is the part that's often missing. Because you see, at the time, in many accounts, many accounts would try to look at mauvais foi, and they would look at the very way in which bad faith relates to the subject and think it's about a form of individualism, a form of individuality. The problem, of course, is that if one looks into the very condition for the possibility of bad faith, it requires a relationship with evidence that disarms evidence, which means that it's already socially embedded. So a lot of those readings that attempt to, for instance, construct thought and these existential phenomenological arguments as if they're antipathetic to a social world fail to see that they actually depend on the social world to make sense in the first place. This happens precisely because they are failing to take very seriously that bad faith. Um, you know that part where I say they want you to be in bad faith? They don't realize that the rejection of social relationships is the manifestation of the bad faith. So the critique of the bad faith is re-establishing a social relationship to evidence and to phenomena. Now, as we deal with these, these concepts, a variety of things emerge. And among them, and tomorrow I get to talk more in terms of phenomena, but today, one of the things that emerge is that, and as we saw earlier, there's a lot of reference to self and other when we talk about race and racism, okay? However, and this is the part where, and, and Sartre is you know, he was working with in the self-other dialectic, precisely because at all time he was presupposing that there can be this human-to-human ethical relationship. What he wasn't quite aware of, and this is one of the things I'd argue then, was how radical the project of anti-black racism is. And this brings us to a different question, which is even though Anti-black racism is a species of racism, okay? And even though misogyny, for instance, is a species of human degradation, one of the errors we make is if we collapse them into the same. And so the question emerged 
that although we can see the relatedness, what would be the difference? Now, part of the difference is connected to the history, the specificity of the history of anti-black racism. And I, because we, um, this is a kind of talk that can go on a long time. I'm just going to shorten it by bringing up an example. For instance, we know the expression today, black lives matter. And there's often a response, all lives matter. Right? So we're, we're familiar with that response. Okay? Now, the response to all, li all lives matter, so you saw me good that, is that that is true the extent to which each group is under the same conditions of respect for life. You see? What advocates of Black Lives Matter are trying to point out is that the social reality around us makes some lives matter more than others. That's what they're trying to point out. And if some lives matter more than others, if they're used as the model, the base model for lives, then black lives are pushed outside of the self-other dialectic. So in effect, this zone of non-being, which we heard about earlier, is a sphere in which there is something else going on when one is pushed out. And what's going on is this. The dominant group does not have to justify the right to their lives mattering. Do you see the difference? One of the things that existential analysis points out regularly is the problem of trying to justify existence. Because you already know, if existence is empty, then the effort to justify it is to impose something on it. You cannot offer anything ultimately for existence, but you're embodying you. But if the problem is you cannot be justified, something in addition to you, then you're going to be searching for something that the person who is challenging you or the group that has challenged you does not have to look for. So in effect, then, its back lives are actually facing the problem of justification that is not faced by the dominant group. Okay. If you look at the dominant group, precisely because, as a group, the justification practice isn't there, justificatory practices become personal and individualized. And that's why Sartre is able to walk about, talk right about how your lover thinks of you, whether you have the project of being a professor or a dancer, so it becomes personal, it becomes your individual project. However, if your existence itself is there, something else happens. And something else that happens is this. For one group, there's a presupposition of the presence of legitimacy, which means then, because that existence is presumed justified, it's treated as a legitimate presence. The other group, because that group is treated as an illegitimate presence, right, means that that group is in the relation of absence. You see? And so that transition, what creates illegitimacy for that group is a very act of moving towards presence. So you already see that logic plays itself out in a very different way. If one is present as a, as a human being, one can move on to other things. If it's illegitimate for one to be a human being, then to become present as a human being becomes a violation of the human world. Okay? Now, should this analysis remain at black and white, right, the world would appear very closed. And this is where an existential analysis is crucial. Because you see, some people, when they look at this, they would immediately say that it is impossible for blacks to appear legitimately. And it presumes that whites, because that system expects them to appear, as already legitimate, then that becomes the Manichaean structure of the entire formulation. Now, this is something some of you may have seen taken up recently by a group called Afro-Pessimists. Okay? And Afro-Pessimists look at these and look at the category of absence and would argue that blacks are, in fact, social death. That there is no being there. There is no relation, etc. Now, of course, for a lot of black people, that's some news. Because black people live with not only each other all the time, but there are many black people who are in relations with people who are not black. 
and they're not in a situation of non-relations. So what is going on here? Well, this is the point that I was saying comes back to the argument about bad faith and anti-black racism. You see, as bad faith, it is a project that's imposed on human reality. And the error many people make is that they confuse the project of anti-black racism or the project, because I'm going to show the convergence later, of sexism as, an, as a complete reality rather than a project always in the making. You see, it's not that black people are not human beings. It's that there's a system and there's a, there, that there's an organization of knowledge working at not only making black people into non-human beings, but making black people believe that black people are not human beings, and for non-black groups to believe the same, okay? Now, this already means then, if we get back to someone like Fanon, and this is one of the reasons those groups refer to Fanon, Fanon basically argues that the relations, when we're looking at something like anti-black racism, are, 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 there's a schism in those relations. So one has the self-other relations through which one can have ethical issues and so forth. But beneath that, there's another group with self-other relations. But if you cross the divide, what you find from one group's perspective is there's a non-self and the non-others. And for the group below, there's the self and others. And so that means that the struggle against anti-black racism is not a struggle against being an other. It becomes a struggle even to become an other. Do you see the, see the difference in the logic? And because in the question of the other, there becomes the possibility of there being the form of ethical questions raised, for instance, in Levinasian phenomenology and many other kinds. Now, as we begin to deal with this, there's an obvious issue also at work when one is dealing with a critique of the Afro-pessimist position. Because the Afro-pessimist position really comes down to saying that if you're black, you're not really a human being. You see what I'm getting at? But there's a form of mauvais foi, a form of bad faith, that's about you really being anything. And so if one is going to decouple that realness from it, one has to now deal with some different kinds of categories. Now, if one comes into the world of how one looks at something like anti-black racism, one begins to realize one has to use different resources. One first resource is going to be the resource of double consciousness. Now, double consciousness, which is something that W.B. Du Bois, Richard Wright, Franz Fanon, many others talked about, is where you see yourself as constituted from the perspective of a dominant other. Okay? So in a nutshell, if the system says to be black is inferior, you're inferior because you're black. However, there's another form of double consciousness called potentiated double consciousness. And potentiated double consciousness is when you see how the first kind constructs you as a problem. But, and if you look at a lot of, for instance, if we get back to the disciplinary decadence, there is a form of social research that examines certain groups and when the methodologies come to an impasse, when the people don't fit the methodological assumptions, the response is, what's wrong with these people? Hmm. We all are familiar with this. Well, the response, of course, could be what I call a teleological suspension of disciplinarity, which is to question the method to see perhaps the method is what's wrong, because to squeeze people into the method makes them into problems. So if one problematizes the method, one is now engaged in a form of potentiated double consciousness and a dialectic emerges in which one begins to realize that if you look at certain subjects, the tendency is to say they're the problem instead of they're people who face problems. And that subtle difference between being a human being who faces problems versus a being a human being who is the problem, that is part of the difference in terms of what happens with the forms of degradation we're talking about that link into misogyny, homophobia, racism, 
classes of and so forth. Okay? <coughs> now, this means then that this understanding requires a form of relationality which shows why using somebody's work like that of Sartre become very important. Because you see, paradoxically, in order to identify blackness as blackness, one has to look beyond it. Okay? It's because in going beyond and transcending blackness, one is able now to locate it as a particular phenomenon. This is something basic in, in phenomenology. In other words, if there were no way of being able to, to, to go beyond the border, you wouldn't be able to establish the border as a border. Okay? Now, this becomes very crucial because this begins to lead to certain forms of critique, very special kinds. One of them is a critique of the concepts as substance-based, fixed, semantic, etc. And what's often replaced is a relational or grammar-based critique, okay? Now, the relational or grammar-based critique becomes rather interesting. And this is the part that's often overlooked precisely because there's a tendency to impose a form of Cartesianism with concepts of substance into what's going on when one is dealing with an existential phenomenological approach such as science. The first one I could bring up is the grammar of gender, okay? And I've already hinted at this. If you look at the old Aristotelian model, for instance, of women as non-developed men, then you already see the grammar, the grammar of absence, okay? And the way in which you could look at this then could immediately be correlated for womanness and blackness in the grammar of absence. And that's why there's no accident that a lot of issues about, around race and gender tend to be intimate. There's a form of intimacy there. And there are historic reasons for that. If you look at a lot of the early colonial records, there was a problem raised when certain groups were colonized or conquered. There was a tendency to refer to those groups in gendered form. So the conquered people were called feminine. Of course, this raises a problem for the localized feminine, say, in Europe, and it's part, ironically, it's, part, it's, it's one of the consequences of colonialism that began to change the meaning of woman. Because one now needed to have a white woman who was equal to a white man, and one needed to operate with a different category than the feminine on these other groups. And the different category was racialization. Now, although the etymology of race can go all the way back to the 10th century, a shift emerged in the modern world from theonaturalism in which one deals with theological conceptions about who belongs and who does not, into an effort to have a secular, non-theological explanation. And this is, uh, by the way, something I, I teach about. In a, I have a, torch, a course called Race in the Birth of the Human Sciences. And if you look at the logic about the way we talk about the human sciences, we talk about the human sciences as if they're these independent ways of dealing with the question of the human that become infected by race. However, what I do with my students is we go and we trace the development of human sciences, and I don't have time to get into it here, but we can talk about it in different contexts, email or whatever else. What I show in that course is that actually race was producing the human sciences. Because with race, you had to have an account of who counts as human and who does not and the ways in which who counts as human and who does not could be sociological, economic, theological, anthropological, etc. And if you look at the production, this means then, in effect, there's a form of um, paternal or uh, relationship between race and the actual sciences, which mean then that ironically their effort to overcome race is an effort actually to overcome their own origins while pretending race wasn't the origin. Now, the other part is that the grammar of presence and absence also has a structure that is theodician. Theodicy is how do you account for the existence of God in the presence of evil. And the easy way to do it is to make evil external to God. So if you look at the writings of St. Augustine, Leibniz, and many of the others, you will find out that ultimately God is 
complete, God is good, which means that all the accounts of evil have to be in human terms. So it makes the human the problem, not God. The problem, however, is that certain systems of knowledge put themselves idolatrously in the place of God. And so if we look at the infelicities of the system, the contradictions of the system, the injustice of the society, all of these, because they see themselves as intact, the source of evil must be external and it becomes the very people who are suffering themselves. So if you look at a, a racist society, it actually makes those who are considered racially inferior the actual cause of their inferiority. They become external to the justice of the system. But they also create something that's well known in Montesquieu. Because in Montesquieu, one form of Montesquieu is the desire to be God. And if you look at the very structure of how such systems work, they would create a group whose purpose it is ultimately is to be God or to be godlike. Now, this brings us to, the gra to this grammar, because you see, this grammar is also psychoanalytically rich. And as we know, in the work of Sartre, he looks at this in terms of, for instance, the Manichaean qualities they offer. You know, that, that infamous section, the, the quality of being, you know, this whole discussion of femininity, sexualization, race to race relation, race to gender, all of these kinds of things. And as he looks at them, as he deals with this Manichaean structure, the feminineness, soft, cold, all these things, all these things can map on his lips, blackness, we see something rather interesting. Because you see, if you're going to make the masculine hard, white, all of those things, and the feminine black, and all these other things, you're going to have problems when you have a black man standing next to a white man. Because what you're going to have is in the categories of blackness, as Fanon pointed out, the biological, the phobogenic, the sexualization of blackness, which means it's an immediate sexual context. And that leads to a problem if there is a homophobic position at hand. Because the very presence of a black male next to a white male in an anti-black framework is an automatically homoerotic situation. This also happens, makes it even complicated if you have a white woman next to a black woman. Because as woman, she is already sexualized, but as whiteness, she belongs with the male. And so even though it may look structurally, say, we could use lesbian as the language, it could be heteronormative. Now, the very fact that I'm able to speak this way tells you about the intimacy of race, sex, gender. You see what I'm getting at? You notice as I'm speaking, it begins to collapse and brings into the other category. And this tells you about the fundamental relationality of them. Okay? Now, the ways of talking about this relationality today, because I said I've been connecting them, have been very popular, particularly in what's called intersectionality discourses. And some of you may have heard about this, particularly the work of Kimberly Crenshaw. But what a lot of people don't realize is Kimberly Crenshaw was looking at intersectionality in terms of tort law. If you think about the models in tort law, law is about a harm that happens when things collide. They work, in other words, it's a logic that works more for a Hobbesian world of atoms that need to be kept out of collision. The problem is that what's, what, what I'm, what right now, the way, the way I'm arguing these issues, that kind of framework won't work to deal with how gender, race, class meet. Because of two reasons. The first one, it's the imposition of a geometrical metaphor onto that reality. If you look at the geometrical metaphor, each line is whole or complete. But we've already rejected the idea that you could just have the gender moving, the race moving, and so forth. They're already embodied as meeting. The second problem that begins to emerge from that, from that way of looking at these issues is the question of dimensionality of meaning. Now, you may say, what, is, what, what I mean by that? Well, if we think about the human world, and this is something, again, I don't have the time to get into it, but the short version is if you look from the work of Ernst Cassero in terms of how he used neo-Kantianism to eradicate the idea of substance and deal with the concept of essence as relational, then that means then one of the problems with that other model 
is that it has an a priori notion of intersection. In other words, if you notice when you talk intersectionality, you have to just intersect all of the negative terms, which means you're going to just always have the same outcome of who counts. It doesn't work for an identity model. For an identity model, one would have to do something very, very different, which is one will have to deal with the complex ways in which a social world is able to produce meanings, which means that the meanings, the identities, are not closed, but are the possibilities to come, which means that the constellations of identities we have now are only part of, but not a complete story. Okay? Now, this also leads to a problem, again, if we go back to the Afro-pessimists. Because if you look at the Afro-pessimist argument, and many Afro-pessimists are nice. One of the things, by the way, my aim here is not to like this Afro-pessimist all over the place. But oh my god, talk about a group that can't take criticism. Whenever you say anything about Afro-pessimism, it, it's classic bad faith. First response is, you're caricaturing it. But when you dig into it, the only way you cannot caricature it is to agree with it. The second problem, almost, almost always, is that you've not read enough on it. It's a, it's a small body of literature. I mean, but the third part that's very complicated is that some of the people who argue for Afro-pessimism treat the categories as ontological. And the thing about pessimism is pessimism is an epistemic notion. And the problem with an epistemic notion is that pessimism depends on forecast. You see, it's about trying to figure out what you should do. And what's missing here is if you go to mauvaise foi, you have a different critique. Because you see, from the mauvaise foi um, perspective, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna look at mauvaise foi, you're gonna realize there's something both wrong with pessimism and optimism when you're dealing with issues of social practice. Because optimism depends on having the form of essence, the foreknowledge, which will bring the essence before the existence. And pessimism will happen, optimism will happen. So in effect, the real question that is often raised by existentialists, and we've heard some of it today, is about the commitment you have. It's about what actually, whether it will work or not, you're going to be committed to do. And that's a very different kind of action. Because that, and this is where it actually separates itself from analytical, liberal political philosophy, from certain ways in which hermeneutics, from certain ways in which even post-structuralism will function. Because you see, if you're going to disentangle foreknowledge for action, then you're talking about the question of what kind of values are brought to it, which brings the existential problem of the spirit of seriousness to the forefront. Now, from that point on, we now begin to see a very different kind of conversation. Because one of them we see is going to be manifested in the kind of commitments which are very different from the prediction models of what it, we, we tend to use in theoretical examples. The other one is we see a critique of something very popular when we talk about race and racism. And to give you an example, let me put it in a gender context. Let's make it heteronormative. Just for the moment. A man and a woman goes on a date. It's a great date. Everything's going fine. They're talking, they're drinking, everything's great. At the end of the date, he drops, you know, he drops her off. Let's just make it, you know. And then he says to the woman, um, I had a great time. She said, I had a great time too. He says, Yeah, you know, now if I could just stop seeing you as a woman, I can respect you. <laughs> Will there be a second date? <laughs> Now, when I give that example, people immediately see the problem. That if he needs not to see she's a woman in order to respect her, he's misogynist. It means he doesn't respect women. Yet, if we look at a lot of the models used for race, that's exactly what we demand. The colorblind model basically says that for people of color to be respected, the non-person of color has to not see the color. But if you need not to see someone as black in order to respect that person, it means you don't respect black people. Now, this is a different question than the ontological question of whether there really are people who are black or not. The basic point, this is where I think that a lot of people in race theory committed error. 
They think the problem of race is about its ontological status. So they argue, does race exist? Does it not? Should we eliminate race and all that stuff? They missed the point. The real issue I would argue is an ethical issue about, I think the more interesting issue is what if there were race? Does that give you a license now to do whatever you want to disrespect those people? Does it mean all bets are off? And so it's a red herring to deal with the ontological state. It's an interesting question. But the other question is going to be how does one develop an establishing ethical relation to difference? And in that book, Bad Faith and Anti-Black Racism, an example I used was something like this. There are human beings who are able to love that which they can never be. We know this in the sense that human beings' relationship with loving animals. It's easy when we say higher to lower, but lower and higher is different. For instance, there were there devoutly religious people whose conception of God, let's just say black women, is not at all that God is a black woman. Now, at a base level, that tells you that human beings have the capacity to love that which is not identical with themselves. And this becomes very crucial because, you see, it gets to a problem that happens in much race theory, which is we confuse equality with sameness. We often think that an ethical relationship requires similarity. But the error we make there is that we fail to understand, like in that example, that respect is a concept that does not require being identical to that which you respect. And once we begin to do it, it means that maybe we have a completely different normative world to think through and build, precisely because at the human reality level, there's already proof that there are actions we can do that don't match the received models of how we theorize human action. And this becomes crucial because, you see, one of the things I like about um, at the, when I was doing that work is, and still am, is that existential phenomenology doesn't demand for you to say in advance what your disciplinary commitment is. It doesn't require for you in advance. If you're supposed to go through a process of discovering what it may be, or discovering what your ethical relationships may be, which means you go through an epistemic, ontological, and normative risk. Now, that said, and this is, and obviously that connects to how play relates to spirit seriousness, all of you. But I want to get to the last two parts, since I know we're all tired, it's a long day, and uh, you know, I'm excited to be in front of uh, a group of people that's connected to the work I've been doing for quite a while. Now, the first part is if we get now to the thought of Sartre. Now, a lot of people look at thought, they look at early Sartre, later Sartre. But when I look at Sartre, around, around topics such as these, I see three Sartres. I see a Sartre that was very much interested in metaphysical and epistemological issues. A Sartre that was really thinking through Henri Bergson. As we already know, he hated Nietzsche, Nietzscheans. Nietzscheans. Too bad Nietzsche hated You know, I talked with his, his uh, godson, Tito Gerasi, and you know, those balloons that he, you know, he used to throw down on Nietzscheans was actually filled with urine, not tunnel. When he used to yell, thus pisses out of two strokes. And in addition to that, there are all kinds of other things that really come out with him. But, but the thing is, if you look at being in nothingness, being in nothingness is a very different type of text. And in fact, I would argue that the pre-being in nothingness texts, like Transcendence of the Ego, Imaginary Imaginatio, actually are more in common with critique of dialectical reason. Now, why is this? Well, one of the things one has to think about when we deal with these issues is we should think about, when I look at Freud, for instance, if you read Freud's Moses and Monotheism, Freud started it when he was a younger man, got afraid to finish it, and then later on finished it actually around here in Bloomsbury. Okay? Now, although his voice may be more like an older man later, there's a way the thought has this continuity that is different here. And we have to ask, what is creating this difference? Well, if you go back to Freud as he talks about patriarchy, which he sees as connected to push out into a form of abstraction, and matriarchy, which he sees as connected to conceptions of the body, uh, in a very basic version, is one is used to touching the body of the mother, mother as a child, everybody touches the mother's body, whereas the father goes, is distant, 
one begins to realize that there is that, a, that way of that distance concerned about ideality in that early period. Then this middle period, the body and this ideality meet. And then something else happens. Now, this middle period, when I would read Being in Nothingness, uh, it really struck me that it's a very odd text. And, and because we don't have much time, I'm going to just tell you straight up what my position is. My position is it's a co-authored text. It's co-authored. I, when I teach, I read Being in Nothingness as a co-authored text by Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir. And there's a lot of evidence for this, not only in terms of the ideas in her, in her writings before Being in Nothingness is published, but also her work on Hegel. If you look prior to Being in Nothingness, you don't find much Sartre engagement with Hegel. You find Hegel's presence there throughout. Now, of course, the obvious question people ask is, why then isn't she listed as a co-author, blah, blah, blah. The longer story is, going to, is connected to, to certain models of what it is to be a woman philosopher. And there was a part of Beauvoir that really wanted the philosophy not to be blocked by a certain attitude to the philosopher. And because I know, if you're that intimate with someone and you're using their ideas and you don't reference them, that's going to create some trouble in paradise. <laughs> Yet it's very odd that the subsequent stuff where she is referenced, when it's non-philosophical, there isn't any problem. And we can get into, and I've spoken a lot with Peg Simons, Deborah Berghoff, and others. We all notice this, and they've spoken with Bobo about this, but that's the part. But the question is, in that part of the century, we see now a lot of themes are linked to gender and race. And there are ways in which there's, there's more in there, because Beauvoir is also in Sartre, also in conversation. And this is where they're different from many others from that period. These are canonical figures who really were in conversation, as we saw not only with the, but let's say in today's language, the global south, right? with the Arab world, with the African world. With, with world of sexuality. They were really dealing with a panoramic approach to the very question of what it is to be a human being, but doing it beyond an abstraction. Now, some, so if you look in the critique of dialectical reason, what's fascinating is Sartre returns to try to deal with these, this meeting at the level of materiality. But at the level of materiality, what he points out is that materialism versus materiality, is a form of idealism. He, in effect, brings the arguments he used in his critique of phenomenalism, as opposed to phenomenology, in imaginaire, to bear in a form of dialectical inquiry that was no longer dialectical. In other words, the problem with orthodox Marxism, you can't argue, is that it was actually non-dialectical. Now, in, in my Fanon book, I bring up again another thing about Sartre, and many of you already know this, he's always learning from the young. And as we know, in 1952, the, the person who oversaw the publication of Pernod S. Blanc was Francis Janson. There's no way Sartre did not read Fanon's critique of Orphée Noir, of Black Orpheus. And remember, ultimately, the critique of Orphée Noir was that it close the dialectic. It was, in other words, when he said that Sartre forgot that, that the black had to become lost in the night. It meant that just as in the discussion I gave of the Afro-pessimists, the, the critique I gave of certain forms of post-structuralism, the problem with those arguments is they want the outcome before the performance. They put the cart before the horse. In other words, they're putting essence before existence. If you put it back into the human world, you now have a situation in which you don't approach the human being as a closed dialectic. This, by the way, is crucial because it connects into the work at, that Peter Cause has done in a wonderful book called Structuralism, The Art of the Intelligible, when he looks at the Levi-Strauss-Sartre debate. Because he argues that what Levi-Strauss was missing is that Sartre wasn't against structure. He was against structure as closed. Because you see, the only way you could be a human being in the, the way Sartre was arguing is you had to be relational. And the relation was production of rules, grammars, lang language, all these things, which meant that the, Sartre, the argument Sartre was making was an argument about a very rich social world. Okay? Now, I'm going to make my concluding remarks. And, uh,
The first one, of course, is what you could see from this portrait is that the underlying elephant in the room question is what is it to be human anyway? You see, if you take this approach, the problem with some models of how race and gender, for example, are talked about is as if they could be talked about without, at least if you're doing them theoretically, advancing a philosophical anthropology. But the question of that philosophical anthropology becomes a question of being radical about the very implementation of the anthropology at the level of method itself. If you think, for instance, about science, one of the projects of modern science has not only been to discover, but there is another form of modern science that was colonial in its practice, a form of coloniality, in an effort to make human reality within a constraint of a form of instrumental, formalistic rationality. What Sartre actually does, but not only him, Dewey does this, Fanon does this, many, uh, C.L.R. James does there are many who do this. You find it in Nishitani uh, in Japan, you find it in Aurobindo, is they notice something very peculiar, that even rationality needs to be evaluated. And the very fact that one could evaluate rationality meant that the human being was in a relationship with a meta-critique of rationality. And this meta-critique of rationality then meant that reason was in fact broader than rationality. You see? Put differently, uh, reason can be, well, at times, non appear non-rational. Okay? Now this then is what led to this now organized Sartre's thought in a way that made him very attractive to what I call Africana philosophy. Africana philosophy, and again, to, to save time, I'm just going to just for it. Africana philosophy basically argues that Euro-modernity, which is a form of theodicy, actually created three problematics in the Euro-modern world because there are other modernities, such as Afro-modernity. The problem of Euro-modernity is that it tried to create an isomorphic relationship between the European and the, and the human as man, so to speak. But that collapses man into a closed system, and man becomes God. You see? So the, if one is going to get rid of that system, one has to find a way to deal with the question of the human being as open instead of closed. That's the first philosophical anthropological question. So philosophical anthropology becomes a feature of Africana philosophy. It also becomes a feature of Africana philosophy because the critique I just gave was a critique of standards. If you're going to reject the idea of European man as a standard, the problem is, and I argue in my work, it could be a very low standard. One would also have to raise the question of whether one could be a standard, but that already interrogates standards. So that means that it leads to the second one, the second one is for obvious reasons. If you talk about dehumanization, enslavement, colonialism, you've got to talk about freedom. And one of the things we know that's at the heart of this philosophy has been the question of freedom itself. We know because mauvais espoir haunts the question of freedom in an interesting way. And this is what many critics of Sartre miss. Many critics used to say, um, hey Sartre, you're an essentialist. And Sartre said, pourquoi? And the response would be, because you say the human being is freedom, that means human beings have the essence, and that is freedom. The problem with that argument is that it presumes that freedom could be a property the way something is a property in substance metaphysics. Mauvais foi is to demonstrate the openness of freedom. Why? Because if you're really free, you're free to attempt not to be free. If we were incapable of attempting to hide from our freedom, then we would have an essence. So the paradox of freedom is manifested in our efforts to escape it. Third, we see that the existential question raises the problem of justification. But what's radical, and this is what's crucial here, the radicality is that, is that well, if you look at the critique of pure reason, it's how you justify reason, right? That's the meta-critique of reason, the critique of pure reason. 
But if you look at the work of Sartre, and if you look at decolonial work, if you look at Africana philosophy, if you look at the work in someone like Fanon, it's more radical than that. And interestingly enough, I don't want to say there wasn't a European who did this. I would argue Husserl in is, is highly misread, and what he was actually doing in ideas was attempting to deal with this problem. How do you deal with the problem of the justification of justification? Do you see the radicality of it? The problem of justifying justificatory practices requires a paradox of not presuming the legitimacy of justification, which is something we got into in a wonderful talk this morning about anime and suicide. Now, all of this then locates, and people such as Abiole Arele, Arele and others have said this, this is what brings Sartre into Africana philosophy, and why he's also read as a global South philosopher precisely because he was willing to do that radical self-questioning. I also, in the book uh, by Jonathan Judaic and Race After Sartre, also said something pretty straightforward, that you know, he, was one of, he was one of those European philosophers that a whole lot of black folks wouldn't mind having a cup of coffee with, precisely because he would want to have a cup of coffee with them. You know, to have a canonical white philosopher who actually liked hanging out with black people was pretty cool. Now, my closing remark then comes to just, I mean, there are lots of things I could say, but I just want to talk about two things, and then, and then I'm done, okay? The first thing is we heard about it earlier uh, was power. Now, one of the problems that emerged from post-structuralism and from a certain forms of analyses that um, would, would, would look at domination is a tendency to treat power as an intrinsic evil. However, the problem there is that, and on the question of power, I'm, I'm, I'm actually with, with Freud, Sartre, Fanon, and many others on this. If we look at power as a function of the human world, in other words, intrinsic to nature by itself, there is this force, things interact. But in the social world, power, power is such that it can make things happen beyond the location of the actor. So, Power is manifested the extent to which many of you could be in this room, but you can have an impact on another side of the planet, particularly not only in terms of your social location, but language. What racism and sexism attempt to do is to close off the reach beyond the physical body, to make the scope, the sphere, the reach of agency only within the physical reach of the body. And that's one of the reasons why if you, you can always spot oppression. Because when oppression exists, it's because agency cannot impact the social world as much as others, and so it begins to affect itself. All oppressed people become obsessed with fixing themselves. Now, this becomes very crucial because if you think of, for instance, a sine qua non of power, one of the ways we think of the absolute conception metaphysically of power is God. Because, you know, I mean, God can do anything. Right? It's a, it just doesn't make sense for God Almighty to show up. And you know if God were to show up, you know, God walked into the room and let us make it a she. If she walks into the room and you say, you're God? Yeah. You're really God? Yeah. The first thing every one of you is going to say is, you're, you're going to say, do something. And if, if she says, no. can't, <laughs> can't, you're going to say, what kind of God are you? All right? She said, you got to trust me. Then you get into the whole other stuff. But the thing is, the abrogation, the, the emplacement of the ability to make things happen in institutions such as the state means that it is to make things happen in the way we expected God. And if you look in Freud's work on culture, right, it's not in civilization discontent, but I, I prefer it should be translated as culture. Culture is a prosthetic god, is what he argues. And what a prosthetic god does is to, one, try to deal, in other words, make you safer through having an impact on nature, because nature can kill you. The volcano could erupt. There could be the tidal wave. There could be the earthquake. There, global warming, all of those things. The second one <laughs> is God could intervene to deal with your body, you know, in other words, heal, you know deal with the way in which you can be ill. Those kind of, but the third, that's the interesting one, is God is supposed to intervene 
we're dealing with one of the, the, the most frightening source of human misery, which is other human beings. And that's why God brings in laws, regulations, and so forth. And if you think about what the state or institutions like those are, they bring in regulations and so forth. They deal with the question of protection, all of these things. So this is another conception of power. As those begin to fall down, the problem, of course, is what gives the state the ability to do this is the relationship that the social world brings in terms of the investments in agents in the social world acting on that power. In other words, it's legitimacy. Now, this is where it becomes very tricky. Because, you see, that legitimacy is what we call the political world. And what racism attempts to do is to write whole groups of people out of the political world. This is why someone like Steve Biko becomes crucial, because he read Sartre, he read Fanon. And what he argued that black consciousness was about was at war with a racist state. What does a racist state want? For there to be categories of people who are locked in their bodies and are not able to function as social beings. So this means then that part of the struggle against racism, against sexism, part of the struggle, in fact, if we get back to its, it, it, this question of what is to be a human being, is the expansion of the options by which the choices human beings make can be meaningful in terms of their reach. Now, why this, now this raises all kinds of questions that I can't get into here, but the short version of this if we, if, if, we, if, we, if we think about this model, is we can see in the world today what is going on as the political reach of people is diminished. Because all over the world, before the people who were obsessed with fixing themselves were colonized subjects, racialized subjects, and we already know this in terms of the question of women. But if you look at the world today, all over the world, there are people attempting to fix themselves from all strata of society. That tells you that there's a form of political erosion that's at work. And this now comes back to tell you that ex this form of analysis, this existential philosophical analysis, is actually one that is socially rich. And its capacity is to build a very rich theory of how we deal with the human world is such that it is sufficiently open for us to move from there, not only in questioning it, but also deal with the question of the new kinds of knowledge that can emerge as we begin to proliferate and transform and create different kinds of human beings. I'll stop there.